All right, ladies and gentlemen, first time on Caravan to Midnight, Mr. Matthew Pauley. Let me tell you a little bit about him. First of all, he's an author. His book is The Murder of Time, colon, Making and Unmasking a Sleeper. I use a Facebook page with no actual websites, facebook.com slash matthew.pauley99. He's a family man born in Toronto, Canada, of American parents. One, a professor. After graduating from university in the mid-1980s with a degree in sociology and computer studies, he held positions from programmer to chief scientist and consults to Fortune 500 companies. Matthew is in the fifth year as a volunteer board member of his residence association. His decade of non-consensual involvement in MK Ultra mind control tests began 22 November 2005 in Toronto in the back of a five-ton armored military van as a test subject for a Joint Control Unified Command 2005 training exercise featuring, quote, enhanced interrogation techniques and torture trauma hypnosis mind control. Matthew believes he has a unique opportunity to make a difference by warning others of the resulting corruption in our democracies. And no one can deny they are corrupt. My problem is... I think it's either um, it's either Stockholm Syndrome or it's deer staring at the forest fire syndrome, but it's too many people to t- seem to be standing idly by while the corruption gets ever worse. Matthew, welcome to the program. Thanks for agreeing to come on with us. Thank you so much for uh, having me, John. I'm really, really glad to be here. Well, why don't we begin where it begins? Um, so you were just a regular guy, just living a regular life, and then all of a sudden, I mean, how did you wind up in the back of an armored military van as part of a program that you didn't sign up for? Yes, uh, that's absolutely true. Um, I was a regular guy, um, you know, as you mentioned in the intro, uh, you know, participating in my community and uh, working as a professional in the computing industry, and I got selected. Um, uh, how this happened, uh, it, the book, uh, The Murder of Time, Making and Unmasking a Sleeper, has a, a couple of chapters actually explaining how the events that led to me being selected, but very briefly I'll, I'll summarize them. Uh, there were two disasters that occurred in Toronto in 2005. One was man-made, the other one was a natural disaster. And uh, the man-made disaster was on August 2nd of 2005. It was Air France 358, uh, an Airbus A310. Uh, technically it's called an overrun, but for all intents and purposes it was a crash because the aircraft, uh, as it was going down, landed past halfway and I was watching this from the fourth floor window of my workplace, which was right against the airport. And uh, it had 150 foot rooster tails of water, there was so much water on the runway, and when it uh, overshot the runway, it knocked down a couple of stands, light stands, and then it went over a bumpy field. Then it descended into a gully, which it, I couldn't see into. There was me and a few other people at the window watching. And then smoke started coming up within 30 seconds. First white smoke, and then after a couple of minutes, it turned into black smoke. And the black smoke just billowed out of that ravine for hours, and that aircraft burnt to the ground. And uh, it looked like they all died. Now, of course, we found out four hours later they did not die. They did an incredible evacuation. But from our perspective, it seemed like they'd all died. And I had what's called a psychological trauma or PTSD kind of event. And uh, as I was running out of the kitchen to try and get some air, I was running through a concrete stairwell, and I imagined these people dying. And it was very, uh, very traumatic. And so much so that in that for a brief bit I kind of probably dissociated and such that within about 24 hours I had no memory of this plane crash. The second um, event was on August the 19th of 2005 where uh, there was a tornado evacuation in Toronto. A tornado touched down in Fergus, Ontario and we were doing an evacuation at work and I was told we're only evacuating our team because there's many different teams of programmers. And I objected, and I told my team leader, look, if we're evacuating the building because of this threat, we should evacuate everybody. And he was panicked, and he said, no, no, we've already talked to them. You know, you're on your own. Say you're on your own. I said, okay, fine, I'm on my own. And I stayed, and one other guy stayed, and uh, then rocks started hitting. Rocks and hailstones were hitting the window, sounding like gunshots. Um, And that's when we went underneath our desks. 
and I went into shock within about uh, 10 minutes uh, because there was nothing you could do to dispel the fear and terror of the windows breaking and that tornado coming in. Um, uh, technically, it wasn't classed a tornado that hit our building because the damage wasn't reported. It actually ripped up the air conditioners uh, above the building. Uh, however, once I was in shock, uh, a gentleman tried to help me get out of there. And uh, he took me to the same stairwell I had fled after seeing the plane crash, which I suddenly now remembered. And uh, I said, no, I can't go in there. I can't go in there. And because it was like a trauma place for me. And I thought I was going to die if I went down that stairwell. Because when you're in deep shock, and, and you know, I was in deep shock, too. It was like I had one pupil that was blown, fully dilated, and one pupil which was pinned, really small. Um, and they couldn't get me medical help because there was, like, you couldn't go out in the storm. Anyway, when he tried to force me through the stairwell the second time, uh, he actually tried to force me through, and you know, physically, and I, I reacted because the stairwell was like death in my mind, and I grabbed him by the lapels and I shoved him, and he fell, and thankfully, uh, he landed on the third stair and ended up twisting his arm, but obviously that was a horrible, violent thing. I've never been like that before in my life, and it was only because I was in deep shock that this heck happened. However, the individual was a former World War II, um, uh, he was in his 70s, and he was uh, a member of the Devil's Brigade, which is, you know, the, the heroes, basically, of the Allied side, in terms of special forces. And he felt that because I'd been violent, I should be interrogated. And he got his 200-pound nephew to come to work right away, and they took me to a darkened room, and they started interrogating me. And because I was thinking to myself, oh, I'm going to be charged with assault, I'll never work again, because as a computer programmer, you have to work in highly secure environments. You can't have criminal records. So I was thinking that's it, because I was still in partial shock at this point, not fully out of shock, because I just had a massage by uh, my, my 10 or actually 13 person team. Uh, they're all Chinese, and Chinese folks know a really good solution for shock, which is rapid hand massage over the body. So I was still in partial shock, and in somewhat irrational, I decided I would try and give him something to distract him, and I started talking about how 10 years earlier, in 1995, I had harbored great resentment towards uh, a neoconservative politician who had done a lot of very destructive things that would involve people ended up dying because of his actions. For, for example, canceling water treatment inspections by public health inspectors, and seven people died in Walkerton, Ontario. And I exaggerated a conversation I'd had with a computer programmer friend of about a half an hour's length or an hour's length, something like that. And I made it sound like it was weeks of detailed, you know, discussions. And, uh, as of that moment, I was tagged as a terrorist, and that was on August the 19th. And I mean, I didn't know I was tagged, but I, in retrospect, that's when I was tagged. The other thing that happened was they learned that I had had a very significant amount of uh, severe trauma in my childhood, and that was reported by this guy as well to the Department of National Defense and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP. So... <laughs> Uh, things were not looking good, and what happened was a, ser a series of escalating um, surveillance was occurring. And the next big surveillance was that on, about, uh, I guess it was October, this wasn't a surveillance thing, it was really um, this guy, Gary, uh, saying to me on the phone, Matthew, how are you doing? I said, I'm fine. You know, he said, listen, have you been interrogated yet? And I said, by whom? And he said, by the authorities. And I said, no. And he said, oh, geez, those guys, ah. Okay, talk to you later, Matthew, and he hung up. And then a couple of weeks later, so this would have been in uh, late October, I had a gas company visitor come to my house and say that they had a new energy conservation program and they were going to give me aerators for my faucets that would be free. They'd adjust the temperature of my hot water tank. And I said, sure, and I let the guy in. And uh, when, I, when he was in the furnace room, he asked me to uh, go turn on the hot water upstairs in the bathtub. And I said, oh, well, I, we got a bathtub down here. And he said, oh, really? You have a bathtub down here? And I said, yeah. So I went, my, right, away, right away my antenna went up. Why does this guy want me to be, uh, leave him alone in my furnace room? But anyway, I played along at that point. So I turned the hot water in the, on in the basement uh, bathroom, in the hot water, uh, in the bathtub. And I came back to the room after a couple of minutes, and he was just finishing up, and he was really in a hurry. And so we walked upstairs, and he pulled out this triplicate form, and green, pink, and white, and it was zero dollars, and I had to sign this invoice with my signature. And then he went running, scurrying out the door, and wasn't knocking on anybody else's doors. And he jumped, his van drove away. 
And then uh, November 22nd, a month later, is when the seminal event happened, where I was approached on the street by a joint task force uh, individual, which I will call Mitch, and uh, an RCMP officer, which I will call Burley. Um, Mitch is five foot eleven, slim build, forty one years old now, uh, from Oklahoma, uh, and he's uh, very senior in the military, he's lieutenant colonel, and he's been doing this mind control stuff for a long time, and he himself uh, was a victim of it, uh, which means actually this would be a good point before. So that's how I was selected to get into that van. Now before even describing the van thing, do you mind if we back up a little bit and give people just a quick overview of uh, Operation Paperclip? That would be just fine. We, we've talked about it before, touched on it on it many times, but every, every time we talk about it, something new comes out. So go right ahead. Sure, okay. So back in 1945, uh, you know, when the war was over, uh, there was a real concern, I guess, uh, in the CIA and the military about uh, all of these scientists, these mind control scientists that the Nazis had uh, in Nazi Germany. And they decided, well, what if the Russians get them? Maybe we should get them. So they you know, airlifted these, these guys uh, and like literally thousands of them. I mean, at first I thought in earlier interviews I had said a thousand. No, 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 no. Nine thousand. Actually, the actual number is about 250 less than nine thousand. So 8,750. And uh, half of them were rocket scientists, approximately, and they went to NASA. And the other half were mind control scientists. Now, these are the same people that would be Dr. Mengele's peers in Auschwitz, in the concentration camps of World War II, who were doing horrific, horrible experiments on twin Jewish children. Um, so these were the peers of that guy. So they were brought into America, and they established themselves in the CIA and in the U.S. military and in research hospitals and they were given jobs and they can continue to do this covert mk ultra stuff which started off at that point i should mention mk stands for it's meant to be uh i understand from the latin germanic mental control that's the mk that's what it means and ultra in other words like really really heavy duty mind control and i can hopefully in this interview share how this stuff works and why it's such a danger to our democracy so anyway, in, in a nutshell, that's how America political and security institutions uh, became, in, you know, essentially poisoned with uh, this ideology and this sort of attitude that, you know, it's, it doesn't matter if we sacrifice people, innocent people, non-consensually, be they soldiers or civilians, because the greater good is more important. And, I mean, as I think most... Americans, Canadians, and people around the world, and the British, uh, the people in the UK, and all around the world, I think. I mean, we, we have United Nations, you know, conventions, and Geneva conventions, that say this is not right, this is not allowed, this is illegal, these are crimes against humanity, but these people, these, these, they don't care. They, li they live in their own protected world, and they're very powerful. And unfortunately, uh, they're, you know, descendants, and, and the people who have been trained by them, uh, continue this work today. So that's Operation Paperclip and MKUltra in a nutshell. I should just mention that in MKUltra the goals of the program were certainly mind control but they were also trying to develop a truth serum for interrogating spies. Now the mind control thing was essentially to be able to, to control people to do things that were against their self-interest, against their will, and even against their interests in survival. Another, and, and, and they would do these horrible things that are against their interests and against their will and survival, and they have no memory about it afterwards for months to years, even decades. So what you have is you've created a perfect mechanism of no accountability that you can, you can carry out political assassinations, uh, hate crimes, and mass shootings to terrorize the public and therefore have the public more willing to accept suspension of their civil rights through anti-terror laws which which are justified based on these false flag uh, events and you also can coerce the public into accepting wars abroad to quote unquote get the terrorists which are based on these false flag hate crimes that are occurring domestically this sounds a uh, pretty widespread it sounds pretty widespread so let me ask you this how widespread is this i mean how many is there any way to even estimate how many 
uh, shall we say, trainees under MK Ultra have been released into the general population? Any way of knowing? Well, I mean, the, the only people that know are the clandestine services, uh, which will not share that information. However, I can just tell you that based on my experience, my direct experience, um, in Toronto, there's uh, five of us that I know of alone. And that's just the ones that I know of. There's probably, based on that, you could extra extrapolate. And uh, I would say by a factor of 10, at least. Uh, and that's just a city of 4 million up here, up here in Canada. That's like not even, barely, to, okay, it's approximately you know, 12% of our population, of Canada's population. What if you magnify that by another 10? Because now you've got the rest of Canada's population and the research going on in other places. Well, now you're up to about 500. And then you, you consider Canada is like a tenth the size of the states. So there's another 5,000 at least in the states. And the, the, you know, these may not seem like large numbers, but every one of the major terror events since 9-11 that I've looked at all match the criterion of false flags done by MK Ultra. Uh, programmed people that have no interest in doing what they did and and they've never been tested for scopolamine which is the drug they use to incapacitate people so that you have no will in fact Dr. Camilio Uribe of the San Jose uh, Medical Center uh, in, in uh, Medellin, Colombia or Bogota um, he is an expert and a world expert on this stuff because they have basically 50% of their emergency room admissions are tourists mostly coming in that have been scopalamined. And he said, quote unquote, I can give you a gun, tell you to shoot somebody, and you will do it. And, and I could tell you that's true. And this drug is the most uh, horrific, it's the worst drug in, in, in all of mankind's history, in my opinion. It allows people to create slaves out of other people and have them do their bidding and have no memory of it afterwards uh, for three to five days and some people don't remember for a lot longer than that. When I was talking about years and, and decades, uh, that's if you've been torture trauma dissociated. But just scopalamine alone is about three to five days and if you have the ability to, to recall. Some people they can't because it's too traumatic for them so their mind won't let them recall it. I'm just, I'm just wondering, uh, so this is administered, I suppose, by injection. Well, so. it used to be uh, just injection uh, and also by blowing a, 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 the powder into your face. That in 2013, uh, NASA, in their wisdom, decided to develop an aerosol form of the world's most dangerous drug. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, what does that have to do with space research? Well, the answer, of course, is nothing. They even say, oh, well, this is for medical purposes. Well... You know, are, is it really worth, you know, um, you know, the danger to humankind and to society? That it, I mean, this aerosol stuff is so dangerous because I've been hit with it about, oh, five times now. And it's a little spray can uh, that's the size of uh, maybe four or five inches tall, an inch and a half wide. You can put it in your pocket. And you spray somebody in the face and it hits the nasal passages and the eyes, the membranes on the eyes. The membranes and you know in the inner mouth, and within three seconds, you're you're completely incapacitated, and that'll last for half an hour to an hour. Uh, but once you're incapacitated, then they could just keep dosing you every half an hour to an hour and keep you in that state, or they can give you a needle, which will last longer. And I've had both forms, um, and it's it's very very destructive to our. Uh, it's huge, huge human rights violation, and it's also very destructive to our democracies because, you know, we the public are reading news stories that are hyped up by the large corporate-owned media, um, which I mean, if you trace that back, uh, you know, goes to a very few families that uh, control that, and they have a vested interest in these wars being fought because they make money. When uh, not only on the arms and all that, but on the reconstruction of the country, because then they have to borrow from central banks, which, we, as we all know, are owned by a particular family. So uh, they hype up these news stories, which the uh, clandestine services engineer for the very purpose of creating fear and terror in the po in the population. 
And you, Dylan Roof, you know, the guy in Charleston who supposedly hated black people. Well, if you look back on his website, the, the research that I've done has suggested that he had many, many black friends. And his black friends said this guy was not a racist. It was only in the last month or two that he suddenly became a racist, quote unquote. Um, and there's other indications. For one thing, he was never tested for scopolamine, as none of these actors are. Um, secondly, he sat in that church for a half an hour or 45 minutes before he took his action. And that's not what you would expect that someone would do if they really hated the black people. They wouldn't hang around for the church service to go on. However, that's consistent with an MK Ultra sleeper. Because an MK Ultra sleeper would be programmed to wait for a signal. And this was actually a test, an experiment was done. I should explain, up here in Canada, we seem to be used for the research and development. We're the guinea pigs. And then the R&D techniques are refined, and they use them mostly in the U.S. So I have actually had the experience of having an air horn blown twice, a particular kind of air horn, handheld, and have that trigger a post-hypnotic suggestion that was previously repeated while I was in a trance weeks earlier to do in a behavior that was not in my interest. And I suspect that's what happened to Dylan Roof. He was programmed to go and wait in there with the gun until he heard a certain signal. And he can actually have uh, visual signals as well. Uh, swath, swaths of, of, of clothing of a certain color or pattern. Um, and for dangerous operations, uh, where it's a destructive thing, they'll even double it so you have a, a safety. So there'll be two different signals. And only when the two different signals are received is the sleeper going to take action. So that's just still, in, but what about James Holmes, right? Yeah. What, what about, uh, you know, this couple down in San Bernardino? I don't think anyone can reasonably expect that a young couple with a, an infant are going to voluntarily leave that infant and go and get into a shooting spree. And we also know that uh, there's in, it reports in the alternative media of uh, three uh, Caucasians, males, tall, big guys, uh, wearing all black, with uh, bulletproof vests, with AK-47s, and they were wearing balaclavas. But through the holes and around their eyes, you could see they were Caucasian. They were shooting, and this was reported by the medical center across the street from where the shooting happened. People in the medical center saw this, and as they were shooting, people were dropping. And that's consistent with how these operations are carried out. You have the two people that play the roles of patsies, whether they shot their, their, their windows out uh, when they were being pursued by the police or not, they were still the patsies. They didn't do the shooting. Then what you have is super soldiers who are people that are deep into MK Ultra from infancy. Uh, they've been raised by Nazis typically that are still around in America from birth and they're torture trauma dissociated uh, many, many times over and over every year and as a result they develop dissociative identity disorder and they may have 10 or even 20 or more alters, which are like almost like little personalities that are programmed to perform certain tasks. And so these super soldiers are the only way, you couldn't get a soldier to go and shoot children. You wouldn't do it. But you take a super soldier who is in a sense a, a very sick person who's got DID, dissociative identity disorder, and you, you, you trigger one of those alters and they have no emotion, none whatsoever. They will like, you know, stab a baby. I mean, they have no, they're completely divorced from their dominant personality. And that's a very scary thing. So anyway, that's the mechanism by which it's done. These big, these big operations where there's a mass shooting. Um, and what does it do? Well, you know what it does? It, it gets played in the media over and over and over again. It's fear porn. And as a result, people then support, let's go into Syria. You know, let's 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 uh, you know take away uh, certain civil rights that the Americans have, or you know, anyway, it's 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 really sad. It's tragic. And as for the deer in the headlights, I think that uh, very few people are totally. I mean, uh, knowing what to do, they just don't know what to do. And uh, I don't have the answer to that, uh, but I know that awareness and consciousness raising. Is, is really important and I also believe in nonviolence so that any any sort of way of changing things has to be nonviolent you know about the Nazi component yes uh, that, that uh, I've never I've never given given up the idea that they're that they're still around 
but it's the uh, it's the ideology. It was national socialism is what they wanted. Uh, Nazi is the the name for um, National Socialist Workers Party. So is global. First, it was just national. Now, is it international socialism that they want? Is that why this ideology is clung to? I don't have an answer uh, to that, and I I I, I, I don't know. Um, what the, the the ideology uh how, how like the, the the deeper workings of of that my impression is it's um a worship of human experimentation to make a kind of a master plan uh and to I, at this point i don't i don't believe in 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 simple root causes i think there's many different root causes here um i think there's the global sort of move to a new world order going on uh, and as part of that you know you it that benefits from having the population divided and going at each other um, I think that the 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 ideology that you're referring to is just left over from when this started at operation paperclip and it's it's actually not uh, required to do the R&D that they want to do and to do these operations that they do it's just a legacy that's been left over uh, and carried on for you know generations. Um, but I mean, ultimately, you know, it, it comes down to really having the executive uh, offices of government um, have you know actual influence uh, over the clandestine services. Uh, and one thing I've learned in my uh, my rather uncommon life. And, and this, this is actually, I can give you an example from my professional career, too, that whenever you have lack of accountability, you're just begging for a problem because someone will come along and they will start, you know, fudging the books or whatever. That's why in the banking business, there's a principle that there always has to be a second person approving and involved with someone else who's moving around large sums of money. Um, and yet in the clandestine services, we don't really have effective civilian oversight. And that's the same here in Canada and in the States. Uh, I mean, I think actually yours is a little better in the States, but we know what's happened, right? I mean, we've had members of the committee that's was in, in the Senate that's responsible, or is it House of Representatives, I'm not sure, that's responsible for overseeing the, uh, the clandestine services actually being spied upon, and they were caught being spied upon by the, by the clandestine services. So. No, we don't really have effective civilian oversight, which means we don't have accountability, which means we're just begging for, you know, someone's going to come along and abuse that power. And if we, we look at the experience and the documents that came out of MKUltra, uh, the, those documents that weren't shredded, uh, we see, in fact, that these people were living like they were uh, above the law completely, raping, pillaging, murdering, uh, stealing. And I can tell you that is still going on. Who, who is doing that? Who are the victims and, and who are the perpetrators of this? Well, um, the, there's, there, there's the, of course, there's the clandestine services and then there's the, the military intelligence, special forces. Uh, yeah. And sometimes people own uh, two titles on both, both the clandestine services and the military intelligence. Um, and the person that's been working on me uh, is one of those people and it uh, I've had death threats uh, over this and so I can't really um, go into the uh, the ideology part uh, that's just off off I can't off I can't talk about it I had a, a concussive grenade uh, under my car uh, a week ago and I was going down Canada's uh, busiest highway the 401, actually it's the North America's busiest, or at least it was a while ago. And that thing went off and two cars pulled over, the one in front, the one behind me, and my car, three of us, all pulled over to check our tires, but it was way louder than tires. And I think that was a bit of a message that I've got to play by the rules. So I can't go into <laughs> too much about that. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's suffice it to say that it's quite reasonable that to conclude that our democracies are turned upside down right now. And uh, there's a big illusion uh, being put forward in the media. It's almost like a friend of mine said, it's almost like 
what you see in the media is the fiction, and what you see in the movies is the reality. Uh, so I, that's a pretty scary place because it's almost like George Orwell, 1984, is you know slowly being used as a plan of action, and we're being, of course, surveyed upon as Ed Snowden has uh, so eloquently uh, documented for us and, and delivered. You know, uh, we're being surveyed so heavily, and the meanwhile, there's this sort of artificial reality in the media, and then we have people who are like, uh, pardon the pun, but eyes wide shut. Uh, and not actually paying attention to what's going on. Because I actually had somebody tell me, a neighbor friend, who was a very you know nice guy, really well educated, and um, you know I get along really well with with his family. And he said, you know, I don't want to know anything about this. And it was like, oh, okay, you know. Um, and there's a thing, there's a principle which I'm sure you're familiar with called cognitive dissonance. Yeah. When when one puts forward ideas which are so radical in terms of if it's true, it's completely challenging my worldview. It's a normal human reaction at some point to go, no, I can't, I can't take this in. I can't agree with this. I can't, I can't believe this because if it's true, my worldview has just been turned upside down, and that's going to leave me very unsettled. And it actually, in my book, in the introduction, I tell a little story. Actually, I actually think it's the preface. I tell a little story about how I was 21 years old. In, uh, in out in Saskatchewan, in Regina, Saskatchewan. I was returning home from Ontario to go back and for Christmas, and I went to a party, and I met a guy. And I guess I was speaking my mind, you know? Uh, I was a little drunk, and I was 21. I was, you know, running for student council, and I was very political, and I was mouthing off about authority. And this guy calls me over and says, hey, look, you know, you're a real talker. Why don't you come and talk with me for a few minutes? And he pulls me over to the corner of the room, and he says, look, if you keep talking like this, one day, I don't have to tell you who it is, but one day, these guys are going to come and they're going to pick you up, and they're going to torture you, and they're going to drug you. And eventually, and I'm arguing with them, going, no, 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 really, it's true, they did it to me, and eventually, they'll make you kill somebody. And if you tell anybody, your parents, your family, your friends, no one will believe you, and your life will be wrecked forever. And when I heard that, I had just come out of uh, the equivalent of the U.S. Peace Corps. Just before university, I went to something called Katimovic, which is our, you know, nation-building citizenship program for young people to do volunteer work. I was very proud of my country with the provisio that I'm appalled at the way our First Nations uh, and North American Indians have been treated um, and still are treated not very well. Their living conditions are horrific. But generally speaking, I was proud of my country and being Canadian, and I could not believe that this could take place in Canada. So I, I remember a few hours after that party, I was standing in my bedroom thinking, and I thought to myself, you know, I can't believe this guy because it's just too disturbing. I was experiencing, I didn't know what the word was back then, the term cognitive dissonance. And 25 years later, I found out he was right. And I didn't listen, and I learned the hard way. And my life is falling down quickly. Not, not falling down, it's being pushed down quickly. My health, my finances, my career, everything. Uh, because I'm a whistleblower now, and I'm trying to make the best of the time that I have left, because I've had a shortened uh, life now as a result of some of the things that have been done to me. Um, so I'm just trying to tell the truth while still trying to stay alive. So it's a delicate balancing act. Let me ask you this, Matthew. Can you yes. uh, can you just amplify this a little? When you were when you were a little buzzed at this uh, at this party and so forth, and you were talking, what were you talking about that made this man come over and say, "Hey, come talk to me for a minute"? And then he told you, "Listen, you need to quit talking." Well, I think I was purposefully. Maybe there were some women there I was trying to impress or something. I was purposefully trying to come off as a real radical revolutionary, you know, and talking about, you know, taking pitchforks and torches and going to the legislature or something like that. I was just mouthing off uh, just to try and get attention, you know. It was really stupid. And I don't remember the exact things that I was talking about, but that's the way I documented it in my book. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it was enough for this guy to realize that, oh man, this guy's going to get in so much trouble if he keeps talking like that. And uh, that's when he pulled me aside. Um, 
so we uh, I, I, do you want to go back to the train of, of events or what would you like to talk about yeah, that, that, that would that would be fine because this is uh, this is remarkable I can't tell you that I've ever had a conversation like this before not in this kind of detail never well I'm glad to hear that and I've never had the best voice in America interview me so um, I'm <laughs> very impressed as well thanks for that man <laughs> oh it all to the Lord thanks um, so, uh, what happened was when that gentleman was in my furnace room, he saw a couple of bottles of hydrogen peroxide and I had those legitimately for using as a disinfectant, but they were looking for anything that they could try and tag me as a terrorist. So, uh, a few weeks later, November 22nd, 2005, I was walking North on Young Street, which is the biggest street in Toronto. It used to be the biggest street in the world. But then they changed the uh, the name of part of the highway. So, but anyway, I'm walking up the street, and these two guys walk up to me. The the American Joint Task Force guy, uh, Mitch, and uh, the big, tall guy, six foot three or four, two hundred and thirty pounds, burly mustache, and all dark and dark hair, and and he was an RCMP officer. And they said, "Look, uh, Mr. Pauly, you know, we uh, we like to ask you a few questions." And and, and uh, I said, "Yeah, sure. What?" And he said, uh, "Why do you got uh, a couple of balls there?" You know, hydrogen peroxide in your basement, in your furnace room. And I thought to myself, oh no, you know, I know what this is about because I looked it up online about this uh, free energy conservation program that this was a ruse to get into a place when you don't have evidence and therefore they must have thought that that's bad stuff. Um, and I told them the truth. Well, I, you know, I, I used it to grow medicinal mushroom because my wife had migraine headaches and they were not being helped by, you know, big pharma solutions. And so uh, they said, okay, but you know what? We just have a few more questions. We got a van just over here. You know, listen, it's called cold holdout because we're in Canada. It's November 22nd, right? And, and, and anyway, I said, yeah, okay, because I knew they were going to come after me. I mean, I could see, you know, the pattern of the escalating surveillance and such. And I thought, well, I'm not a terrorist, and I know what, that they think this because I exaggerated when I was in shock being interrogated because I was afraid of getting you know, charged with assault. So I'll just explain this to them and then let me go. Big mistake. Um, I was marched through a parking lot. It was actually the site, a Canada's historical site, of the, <laughs> ironically, the uh, first rebellion in 1837, the Montgomery Rebellion. And then uh, there was this van at the other side. I tried to stop. I, I said I didn't want to go any further because it was all, all creepy because the van was, all, the, the parking lot was all dark. And normally there's three sodium vapor lights, but they were somehow extinguished that night. And I got afraid, and I said, no, I don't want to go. And they said, the big, huge guy said, keep walking. Like, he yelled it at me, and I was, like, terrified. So I kept walking, and the, the van was surrounded by three guys on each side, like, the, the, on the other side of the van and to the left and to the right. And the fourth guy opened the van from the back door and invited me in, and I got inside. And that's when my life changed forever. Um, I'll tell you what happened. All right. They did a uh, medical examination where they asked me all these questions about medical conditions or any medications I was on, and then they spread my had me spread my fingers on this fold down table, and they took a knife and they uh, tap 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 tap. First the Canadian went uh, through all my fingers, trying to not to hit the fingers right, and and then the American went. He was much better actually, and tap 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 back and forth. And then they took a single hole puncher. Of course, they look at my face each time. Look at my face, see if I'm terrified, right? Then they took a single hole puncher. Uh, I should have brought it. It's upstairs. I got one just like it, in which the flange was removed, though, to hold the paper down. So you just had the top and the bottom of part of it. Yeah. And they, they, they went to go uh, test every one of my fingernails to see if they could pull any of the fingernails out. They went through all the fingernails. And each time they look at my face to see if I was terrified yet. And this, we weren't even started yet. This was just calling, showing the tools of torture. This is like for a thousand years or more. This is what they do in torture: is they show you the tools of torture at the very start, so that they can get a, a little, you know, a little bit of a lift, uh, get you terrified. And then I, they sat me down at this torture chair, which had huge uh, aluminum tubing, round tubing, uh, that w went above the head, behind the head, so that your your head was not resting on the frame, uh, so that you wouldn't get bruised. And in fact, what was between the frame? was three and a half inch black uh, wide uh, seatbelt webbing, very all tightly woven. 
So all behind me, I was all, and, and my arms were supported, again, the same deal, wide uh, aluminum tubing, round tubing, and then supported on this black seatbelt material. And same thing with the legs. They cuffed me, handcuffed, leg cuffed. Then they inserted a 100cc needle in the left arm uh, of scopalamine. I'm oh, sorry, not scopalamine. It was sodium pentothal. And immediately I felt like I just drank four beer. Mm -hmm. Just pushed the plunger in a little bit. Yeah. And then uh, a shock cuff, uh, electroshock cuff, upper right arm, and it had a cable to go into remote control. And then they uh, taped my eyelids open with medical tape. And it was the RCMP officer who hooked me up with all this stuff. And he was an expert. I mean, he got one of the eyes that was hurting too much. I said, you know, that really hurts in the left eye. He said, oh, no problem. I'll fix that for you. Zip, zip, zip. Done. Like, this guy had been taping eyelids for years, mm. which is, doesn't say very much about our National Security Department. Uh, I mean, this, is, this shouldn't be happening in, in a democracy. Anyway, um, once they had me all hooked up, then the interrogation started with, you know, are you a member of Hezbollah? And I said, uh, no. And do you know anybody who's ever been, you know, have you ever been a member of Hezbollah? No. Do you know anybody who's been a member of Hezbollah? No. Um, have you ever, you know, thought about Hezbollah and, and maybe something you want to join? No, no, no. And then they went through Hamas. And then they went through all of these Arab or uh, Islamic uh, terrorist organizations. They're labeled in the, in the U.S. State Department as terrorist organizations. I had never heard of them. Like there's 30 of, 30 of them. And then we got some interesting ones, stuff like PETA. And I'm going like the people for the ethical treatment of animals. And they said, yes. And I said, well, I didn't know they were a terrorist organization. But anyway, no, I'm not a member of PETA. And are you a member of uh, the Black Panthers? Or sorry, the White Panthers. And I said, no, I'm, uh, I didn't know. I thought it was Black Panthers. And no, no, was, there's White Panthers now. No, no, I'm not a member of the White Panthers. And, and it, when each one, there'd be five questions approximately. They just worded slightly different ways. Of course, I've never been a member of any terrorist organizations. I've never, you know, been interested in, in, in that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, um, once that was done, then they started, uh, you know, going into this teaching of enhanced interrogation techniques. So they would buzz me, by the way, like they zapped my, my arm when I was not responding fast enough. And then they decided to go into the American was teaching the Canadian Special Forces. They're both Special Forces, JTF and JTF-2, because that's a Canadian one. So the JTF guy is teaching the JTF-2 guy how to do no-mark torture. So no-mark torture is, uh, for example, uh, they'll take you your eyes, they tell you to close your eyes, keep one eye open so you can look at them. They want you to see them. And then they, they take their finger like this, and then they flick the eyeball. And that really hurts, because it goes into the eye socket, and, and it really hurts. And another one is... Uh, they taught, they, they was, the American taught the Canadian how to, uh, another no mark torture. You take the, the, the knuckles, the knuckles, the, the first, I guess these are the second joints on the fingers. Yeah. And you get you to clench your, your teeth together. And then you just twist it like this really hard, really fast like this. And what it does is scrunches the inner mucous membranes and the inner very tender membrane of skin in your, uh, in your mouth against your crowns of your teeth. And of course, they all get marked up and, and it's really painful. Um, and then of course, you know, face slapping, lots of that. Um, and uh, my arm was dislocated. The JTF guy dislocated my arm and I, I was just like almost crying. It was so painful. And he says, now listen, I don't want you to give me any trouble. You're gonna answer all my questions and not dick around. All right? he was really, really mean. And he was a sadist actually. He took pleasure in this. Sounds um, like it, yeah. So this went on, and then they decided to teach the uh, Canadian how to do Monarch Mind Control, or, or MK Ultra Mind Control. And that's where the real scary, scary stuff happened. Because um, what, he, what he did is he had the electric shock cuff, and what he was doing is he was kept answering or asking this question over and over. What is your Arabic name? What is your Arabic name? And I'd say, okay, Mohash, because they, they translated my name, Matthew, and they said, it means Mohash. And I said, okay, Mohash. And then they, they zap me. So then I go, oh, okay, uh, what's your Arabic name? And I just make up a name. And they zap me. And then so I tried being silent. And then what I was getting is a zap every, about one out of every three times. And they were random. And what that does to your mind, when you have random electric shocks or random pain, and you have no ability, you, they, they, they tantalize you with some possibility of control by asking you a question, 
and then they rip it away from you. You have no control because you're going to get a random electric shock. You can only take, an average person, I swear, you can only take 10 or 15 minutes. In my case, it was 10 or 15 minutes, and I dissociate probably a little quicker because of the severe trauma that I had as a child, so I dissociated early, which is actually, this is a good point to explain, that the reason that they prefer people who have had severe traumas in their childhood is because dissociation uh, event is like chopping a, a block of wood. Like when you go camping, you take a round of wood, you got an ax, and you know the first time you're chopping it in half, it's really hard to break it, really hard to split that hunk of wood. You might even get a wedge in there to try and do it. But it, once you've got the half, the second time it's a lot easier to split the wood. Now you've got in quarters. Now you take a quarter piece and you chop it, it's much, much easier. Right? So it's the same thing with dissociation because it's really splitting the mind. What happens is when you get tortured far enough or traumatized far enough, your dominant personality just goes to sleep. And what's left, and this is a normal human reaction to excessive trauma to protect you, and what's left is a very childlike persona of yourself from when you're about five or six. Yeah. And you have no ability to resist, you're vulnerable, and then that's when they hypnotize you. So anyway, dissociation is the key to all this. The other thing that's really significant about dissociation is the moment you're dissociated to the time that you come out of it, you're in danger of dying from shock. You can slip into shock easily. Second, you have complete amnesia of that dissociation period from months to years and even decades. Sirhan Sirhan still has no memory of what happened that day when uh, Bobby Kennedy got shot. Yeah. yeah. And so dissociation is a very vulnerable thing that we have, We're in a very vulnerable state, and that's when the hypnosis comes into play. Now, anyway, getting back to the story, they're asking me this thing, what is your Arabic name? What is your Arabic name? And I keep giving them answers. I keep getting shocked randomly one out of every three times. Finally, I dissociated. And it, everything became very clear. And I was recording everything in high def. Like the brain records it all because this is like a deer. If, you know, if a deer gets almost hit on the highway, it's going to be really careful about that highway for the rest of its life, right? Same thing with human beings. I think this is a normal mechanism of the brain that when we're dissociated, we record, we're passive, we're like a child, but we record everything in high def. Really, really care. I have dialogue in my book. You'll notice in my book when you get it, I shift it to you. Sorry, it'll be a day or so, but uh, there's a lot of dialogue, and I actually recall the dialogue in detail of what was said to me and what was said to the other people back and forth. Um, anyway, so I'm now dissociated, and Mitch pulls out, he's explaining to the Canadian at this point, you see, you see the state he's in now, how his eyelids are flickering against the tape? Because my eyelids were flickering against the tape, that's how terrified I was. And I was just like this in the, the corner in the chair, right? And he says, watch this. And he takes his hand, there's, remember there's bright floodlights in my eyes, and he puts his hand like this across to cause the shadow to rapidly move in front of my face. And I just cringe in the chair as far back as I can. And he says, that's another sign. It's the second sign. Now, you've got to be careful. At this point, they go into shock really easy. Now, Matthew, you know, slow down your breathing. Slow down your breathing. Don't go into shock. So I slow down my breathing. And then Mitch pulls out this little cube. It's like a, a hypnotist uh, prop. It was a cube with a hologram in it, and it was an animated hologram. There was three LEDs, red, green, yellow, or something. And as it was pulsating the colors, that mutated the uh, hologram. So you saw this little Apollo 13 taking off on the moon, and you saw, uh, as well, a little eagle coming out of a tree. I mean, these were like national symbols of the United States, right? And so I was just in, enraptured with this. And, and I said, oh, it's so beautiful, you know, can I touch it, you know? Because I'm like a six-year-old. And so then he had me hypnotized, and he says, Matthew, from this point onwards, you're going to listen to my voice, you're going to keep your eyes open, but you're going to sleep. I want you to sleep now. And I just fell back in my chair like this and just kept looking at him. And he said, now you're going to repeat everything I tell you to repeat. And I'll give you the first post-hypnotic suggestion. There was three. They were all lethal. The first one was, Matthew, if you ever find a gun in your jacket pocket, or if I ever find, because I have to say it in first person, if I ever find a gun in my jacket pocket, I will immediately go to the nearest closet in my house. But before getting into the closet, I will turn the safety off on the handgun. 
Once I turn the safety off, I will go into the closet, close the door, and put the gun up to my head in one motion, pull the trigger. So they were programming me so that I would kill myself if they put a gun in my jacket pocket. And then there's a second part to every post hypnotic suggestion, which is what I call the anti-pasta. And that is that you have to say, and for this one would be, I will never remember this program until I find a gun in my jacket pocket. And again, I will never remember this program until I find a gun in my jacket pocket. And you have to say this five or six times, and the, the main suggestion about a dozen times. Now, what, now think about that, right? So a person's hypnotized, they're hypnotized to not remember the suggestion in their conscious mind, but they're programmed to remember it when they see the trigger. And the whole thing is taking place over this amnesia period of dissociation. So once this is over, they'll have no memory of it whatsoever, except in their subconscious. So what you've created is a sleeper at that point. And until that person goes through enough, uh, enough therapy and enough, uh, uh, basically, being able to be in a safe environment and have support, family, friends, and have safety and therapy, they'll eventually be able to recall that dissociative event. They'll eventually be able to recall the post hypnotic suggestions. But in that period of time, it might be like four years, right? Now, for those four years, you have a sleeper. They don't even know they're a sleeper. And it's non-consensual. They don't want to be a sleeper. They didn't ask for this. But if now they get triggered, they will do the action. And I just thank God that I didn't get a gun in my jacket pocket in those four years, or however long it was. I, I've actually dated in the book I, uh, when I remembered each suggestion. Matthew, if you second, like, go yeah. ahead. I'm sorry, you go ahead. You had something else you were going to say. I was going to say that the second, uh, the second one I'm not going to give you the verbatim for, but it was to uh, essentially to follow instructions to kill somebody upon given certain triggers. And the third one, which is to me really upset my doctor when I told him about it, um, third one was, if I ever find myself in the psychiatric wing of a hospital or in a psychiatric hospital, the first time I'm alone with a doctor or nurse that's wearing a stethoscope, I will immediately strangle them with it. And then he took out a real medical stethoscope, showed me how to fold it over with the metal lens on one side, the rubber on the other, and how to do that to somebody. And for the, the consequences of that, of course, are that they don't want they don't want the sleeper to go into a psych hospital and get some help and actually start to recover the memories because then maybe they'll become a whistleblower like I have so they want to they want to program them to self destruct by taking another's life um, so that's pretty disturbing uh, so I'm sorry for those in the audience who uh, are finding having a hard time about it now um, but this is true this happened uh, it's documented in my book and I'm a computer programmer, uh, consultant. It's completely against my interests uh, to be talking about this because I'm on camera with my real face, which I haven't done in an interview except once before, and that was because my life was in real danger. And I guess maybe that's why I'm doing it this time, um, because I think my life is in danger. And so uh, this is not about me, fame, and fortune, because listen, everybody I tell this story to. From my even my closest family, my own father, okay, my own you know brother, uh, anybody I tell this to, they walk. Yeah, they walk. I can imagine because they think, oh my God, you know, cognitive dissonance comes up. This can't be true. It'll disturb my worldview. Number one or number two. What if he's just delusional? He might be dangerous. Or number three. What if it's true and, and maybe these people will come after me, you know? So it's, it's people walk. I've lost friends, best friends, that are keeping their distance from me. And, you know, I can't pass too much judgment on them because I don't know, you know, if, if I would be strong enough myself to be able to handle this if I was someone's best friend that announced this to me. So I want people to know I'm not doing this because I'm looking for fame, fortune, or recognition, or something like that. I'm doing this because I read Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, in my 20s. Now, Viktor Frankl survived Auschwitz and the concentration camps, and he made, a, he was, he made incredible observations of studying people who survived, and he found one thing in common. They all, like, first of all, I mean, only some of them survived, right? But 
very few survived, like tiny, tiny few. But all those people who survived had a real strong meaning in life. They had a real strong reason to live. They had, you know, a lovely family they, they wanted to be with. They had a book they had to write uh, or something. It was really important to them. And that's, I decided in my 20s, because, of course, I was dealing with a, you know, a difficult childhood and such, that I would have to do something like this. I would have to make meaning in life my thing. I'm going to have to make it so I contribute to this world for this, this and future generations. And so I feel, as you read in the, in, the, in the intro, that this is an opportunity for me to contribute to the world by getting this message out. Anyway, um, so that's the, the compression of, of three and a half hours of torture uh, into a few minutes. Um, and uh, that was just one event. Um, unfortunately, it didn't stop there. I've had uh, five home invasions and two abductions. And they're all very violent. Um, and they all start with scopolamine drugging. And uh, then they no mark torture. Usually it's joint hyperextensions, fingers, uh, wrists, um, shoulders, and slapping and, and such until I dissociate. And then once I'm dissociated, I'm hypnotized. And then I'm forced to repeat post hypnotic suggestions. And I, I tried to be a good journalist about it. In my book, I've actually got a chapter where I just go through the experiments just on one home invasion in January uh, 2015. There was four MK Ultra experiments where they're constantly es escalating the level of, of, of things that are uh, in terms of how much it's not in my interest to do. So these things are getting increasingly destructive and against my interest. And I documented them all, these four experiments. And it's actually a very interesting thing for people who are interested in psychology to see how they did this and what they're, you can really tell what they're trying to do. They're trying to really map out the most optimal way of gradually turning someone into a more and more effective sleeper, willing to be more and more uh, obedient and do what they're told, even if it involves them, you know, doing something horrific. Um, and I should say that there's been a... Uh, there's been stuff here in Toronto. There was a crime in December of 2015 by a person that uh, named Rohini Bissar, Bissar actually, who was in a shopper's drug mart and stabbed someone to death. And she had all the signs, all the signs of being an MK Ultra test subject. And again, of course, she hasn't been tested for scopolamine. Just like all these false flag events in the states. Okay, I won't call them false flags because people don't maybe believe that yet. But ask yourself this: How many of those mass shootings in the states? since 9-11. How many of them were the people that were, we were told that did it? How many of them were tested for date rape drugs and specifically for scopolamine? Zero. That's how many. I haven't seen any reports of any of these people being tested. And until we get as a society where we demand of our legislators that these kinds of crimes that have large fear, terror of, of the public, that these kinds of crimes require these tests for scopolamine, and similar drugs. They're called tropane alkaloids from the deadly nightshade family, by the way. Until we do that, we can't really believe that these things are authentic. We can't know the story that's in the press is the right story. You know, I'm wondering, I'm wondering a bunch of things and all of them simultaneously. How You've given us an outline of, of how someone who is um, someone is drafted, conscripted to do a job, but how do you draft the trainers? Well, I can only tell you uh, about my experience, uh, and my experience, my trainer um, was in fact a descendant of one of the Operation Paperclip guys. Makes perfect and sense. He he actually would de meet the definition of a super soldier. Let me um, explain to you. If you have a Venn diagram, right, large circle, and you call that, this is MK Ultra uh, sleepers, or sleeper assassins, just sleepers, okay? My MK Ultra monarch mind control. Inside of that large circle, which may be, you know, hundreds of thousands, inside of that circle, you got a very small circle, and that very small circle are super soldiers. So super soldiers, instead of being just picked up off the street and programmed, these are people that were raised 
by Nazis usually from birth. And I'm not talking one, I know of two. And they were raised from birth by Nazis. They were tortured and tortured until they became uh, dissociative identity disorder. They were programmed with hypnosis to have different alters that, that made the DID, you know, uh, diagnosis. And some of them can function re relatively effectively in society. And they can actually be successful and say be at high levels in the military or civilian intelligence uh, or clandestine services but if they get triggered you know they're they're look out uh, because you just get a different person and if it's not the dominant personality the different person is potentially you know dangerous uh, so the uh, my experience is the individual that has been working on me, Mitch, uh, is, meets the definition of a super soldier. Um, and the problem is, my from an ethical perspective, I mean, I could say, okay, I feel sorry for him and all that, but you know what? When I was 21, and I realized that I came from a really bad childhood with a lot of psychological trauma, I thought to myself, I better get myself to a therapist, to a psychiatrist, to a psychologist, you know, anybody, and I did. Now. True it is, in Canada it's a little easier to do that because we have free health care. But I also spend my own money, you know, $25,000 uh, seeing therapists. Because if we don't, if we, if we get into adulthood and we just say, no, that's it, I'm not going to bother, you know, it's too expensive, I'm not going to do any therapy, then we're responsible for our actions that are criminal, that are crimes against humanity. So that's, that's the ethical uh, analysis by me. So we, can we assume that if um, people are contacted, uh, however harshly, like yourself, to do some jobs, do you have any idea that you actually did any of them? Well, uh, the last time I tried to answer that question, uh, my phone line was cut in the middle of an interview on Coast to Coast with George Nori. So I don't think I'm going to answer that question. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. So. And I don't, I don't get contacted like I get a phone call or something. It's like I'm walking down the street, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm surrounded by guys and dragged into a van with an inhalant-soaked rag, and and put unconscious, and I wake up some other place. Gotcha. And and then you know, at that point, I'm coerced. I'm muscopalamine. I'm tortured again until I dissociate, and then a gun is pulled on me. And I'm told that I'm in another country or something, and I'm an enemy of the of the people here, and you know, and then I get you know dropped back at my house, and that's only happened once. Wow. Uh, thankfully, but that's not to say that there's not been other things that have been done that have been trying to you know be against my interest and my will uh, to try and get me in trouble. Uh, there's been you know a, a couple of those things, but um, anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Your question. No, no, it's okay. I was just thinking it's not necessarily all about um, guns and knives and um, I'm thinking that this technique could be used over a period of decades yeah. among say certain politicians that we can't seem to get rid of so that they will continuously uh, toe the line as it might be and in fact um, somebody you look like you might want to respond to that one maybe well, not well uh, the little bit of digging around in that department uh, indicates that in fact that is the case mm. uh, and at least uh, the, there was a certain generation of uh, males who held the presidency and at least one of them um, I'm not talking the Kennedys I'm talking recent uh, and at least one of them uh, you see there, there's a history of this stuff being used on certain families that are in the 13 families. I'm not going to use the I word because I don't like the I word. It just glorifies them. Um, and the reason that the, these, these families, they're, they're the richest, most powerful families, uh, the reason that they do this is that they keep power in the family. They keep everybody under control, towing the line uh, by using torture, trauma, dissociation. In fact, we know from uh, anthropologists that the ancient Egyptians were using torture trauma to create slaves. And so it's no surprise that the 13 families are, are using it uh, to keep themselves in power and stop everybody from get, getting out of line. So yes, 
politicians to to the current day, I imagine, uh, are in fact uh, some of them are being controlled in this fashion. The ones up at the very top, it seems, whether they're located yes. in England or the United States or anywhere else, they're all actually related by blood. Yeah, Tony Blair, Gore, Bush, bunch of them. This has been uh, this has been coming out in various reports for years. Yes. You know, and then and then of course there's the secret societies, right? The right. skull and bones, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the other secret societies that these folks belong to in Bohemian Grove and all that. Uh, it's a very incestuous uh, little power game going on there, and uh, you know, dabbling in the occult and and that sort of stuff, and it's pretty creepy. Yeah, and it's not much of a stretch. You know, if you're at a party getting a buzz on there and talking, maybe one to impress the girls or something, and uh, somebody pulls you aside and says, listen, you're going to get yourself killed or weirded out or, or messed with real bad if you keep talking like this. And so you go, okay. Combined with what you said about uh, some of your closest friends have just decided to just kind of do that slow moonwalk away from you and out of your life. Yeah. It's, it is not too much of a stretch to assume that, okay, you're in the university environment. Uh, you are special. You are now part of a, uh, you've been invited, which is quite flattering, to join this uh, secret society of one kind or another, whatever the name happens to be. And then it's understood, as these people become your close associates, that there are things that we simply do not talk about. Because if you do, something really bad will, in fact, happen. You're dealing with the very uh, highest of the muckety-mucks. You're dealing with the proverbial elites. And if they want you to disappear, you will. So understand... It won't be just you. I mean, they can mess with your families. They can mess with your friends. They can mess with anybody they want. And you know what will happen to them? Absolutely nothing will happen to them. They'll go on. They'll forget about you. You'll disappear, and that'll be it. Robbery, something, slipped on a banana peel. You're gone. So if you're in now, and there is no out. So you're going to have to play by the rules, or your problems are over with, like permanently. And then you think, okay... Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with your analysis. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so um, I think we've seen, um, I've seen in some of the, the big name people in the alternative press, I don't want to name them, uh, even in one of the MK Ultra whistleblowers, um, I have a list of a number of fantastic authors that have put out some incredible books, and one of them keeps sort of avoiding talking about MK Ultra. And I, I passed judgment on him at first. And I thought, you know, how could someone self-censor? And then they uh, threatened to kill my family, um, my six-year-old niece in, uh, in New York. Um, they also threatened to kill um, my family, like my, I don't want to say. And it's, you know, when people do that, it, it really has a fundamental effect. Um, so... I'm trying to tell the truth and trying to be straight and everything, and, and at some point I, I have to pull back because I, I don't want to cross that line. And I thought that I was following the rules, but apparently I wasn't in the previous interview because I, I did say something I think that was probably over the line. Um, and then I had the explosion under the car. Uh, so when they follow up these threats with actual explosions, I think, you know, you've got to start taking it seriously. Um, yeah, I think you're right. So the, I, I want to mention this because I'm very in, my, in debt and inspired by uh, there's a couple of people that uh, you may have heard, I'm, I'm sure, of some of these folks who, um, see, I should have earmarked the page before I did this. This is, I'm just going through my uh, presentation that I've done at the University of Toronto. Um, there's five, well, I'll just name them myself. Uh, there's uh, Fritz Springmeier, there's Kathy O'Brien, there's Bryce Taylor, and uh, myself, and I'm sure there's uh, others that uh, put out books on MK Ultra. And oh, here we are. Kathy O'Brien, Carol Rutz, and her main book was A Nation Betrayed, and Kathy O'Brien with Mark Phillips was Transformation of America Through Mind Control. And there's, she did other ones like Access for, Denied for Reasons of National Security. Kathleen Sullivan, Unshackled, The Survivor's Story of Mind Control. Bryce Taylor, Thanks for the Memories. And Fritz Springmeier, 
uh, the Illuminati formula used to create an undetectable total mind-controlled slave. And he did a couple other books after that uh, on the Illuminati. And so these people are incredibly brave, uh, and I, I'm very much inspired by them. But nonetheless, there's a, for the, there's a pattern here that's uh, being used against whistleblowers and MKUltra, where um, they first go after, you know, you, and then they go after threatening your family, and then they uh, go after your career, and they do something at work, as they did to me. My last two contracts were ended early because of interference from these guys. Uh, one guy in particular, actually, my, you know, Mitch. Um, so then they try and get you poor by killing your career. Yeah. Now, thankfully, I'm, I'm, I'm a computer expert, and it's a very high-demand stuff, but uh, I can't even stay within commuting distance of this guy because it's very dangerous. Like These things just keep happening, and the intimidation on the street and, and the surveillance and everything, it's, uh, it's like you, know, you have to now leave your home. Like, I, I don't, to me, I'm just shocked that that my prime minister, who I've uh, really, uh, released several large whistleblowing emails to, uh, I guess doesn't have the will or the power to stop this. And it's like Canadians are being used as guinea pigs. And uh, it seems to me like amongst the worst human rights violations I've ever heard of. Um, comes close. And, yeah, it certainly comes close. Um, I mean, when you're getting to torture uh, repeatedly and, and doing all the things they do to us, it's just unreal. When's the last time you had any contact like that, if you can say? On the 11th of July. Of this year? Yeah. Oh. And also the 19th, the week of the 19th of June. And uh, before that, it was uh, February. And before that, it was January. Sorry to, uh, sorry to pose a sophomore question, but what do they yeah. want? Aren't they done? Are no, they uh, it seems that uh, I should maybe say that I think that there's a, a bit of a cat and mouse thing happening here. Yeah where uh, they enjoy, the cat likes to play with the mouse, and uh, that's sort of, I think there's a bit of pleasure in this because he's a sadist, and the people who do this are sadists, and they like to see you squirm, and so I think that's part of it. Yeah, that sadism thing, that's a, that's a drive as strong as sex ever thought of being. In fact, some people prefer sadism two sexual relations. One has only to uh, hear some yeah. of the stories from uh, Central America, particularly, where these, uh, these things are quite commonplace. Oh, that's a good one. I'm glad you brought that up. In January of, of 2015, as I was increasingly looking like I might actually get away with you know, publishing a book, uh, Mitch asked me, Matthew, is there any group of people that you're like, more afraid of than any other group? And I said, you know, I, I love all people, you know, I'm not discriminating against any people. And, you know, you've got to give me something, Matthew. And it's like he has to go back to his boss with an answer. So I said, well, when I was in university, in Trent University, and doing sociology, and I was in a student union, you know, and we were a very left, kind of liberal university. Uh, and that was when Reagan was in power. In Central America, we had killing squad, death squads, funded by the CIA. In El Salvador, in Guatemala, you know, you name it. And then like a million people, or over, over a million people, were murdered. So I said, well, maybe, you know, the guys from Central America that were the CIA-funded guys that, did, you know, the death squads. So that was in January of 2015. Oh, okay, now what's the date of the uh, home invasion? That would have been February. The February home invasion... After Mitch does his usual tricks of, of breaking into the house, I have spent $10,000 on security, by the way, in the last year, uh, including I went through three burglar alarm systems. I have seven locks on the back door. But these guys, you, you should see the training. In, in uh, uh, Cahill's book, The Assassination Complex, he, they, they leaked the, the courses that these guys take, JSOC takes. There's like 40 courses or more, 50 courses on lock breaking. Like they, they can get through anything. It's nothing to them. And I've, I've seen it. He's even demonstrated it for me. Um, anyway, they, they got into his usual tricks of scopal me to the face, and uh, I'm done at that point. And then I'm tortured until I dissociate. And then the usual you know, hypnosis and then interrogation. 
And then he takes me for a walk. And he said, we're going for a little trip. He walks me out the front door. And to all intents and purposes for people who are watching, it looks like it's voluntary. But I'm scopalamined. I am not there voluntarily. And he marches me off to 550 Duplex, which is uh, just the end of my block. There's an 18-story apartment building. And we get into the kitchen of this place. It's empty. It's all clean. No knickknacks. doesn't look like people are living there. And he tells me that, he, you know, I really don't know mar martial arts. You know, I'm just a bullshitter. And he's goading me goading me and saying, you know, you really don't know martial arts, you know, and I haven't trained in a year or so, I mean, I wasn't never really an expert or anything, but anyway, he's goading me and going, he finally says, come on, demonstrate to me, Matthew, demonstrate to me. Well, this is a great opportunity, right? I mean, you know, so I jumped on him and uh, he did, he fought back, but not really hard, I could tell. And anyway, I got him on the ground and I was just applying a double choke from behind. And all of a sudden this guy walks in with a 45. And it's pointed right at me, six feet away. And I drop Mitch on the floor. And, I, and then Mitch turns to the guy and goes, you waited long enough. And he looks to me and he says, you didn't expect this, did you? And I said, no, I didn't. And so then I, I'm backing up against the wall of the kitchen. And this guy's coming in. He passes Mitch. He comes towards me. And he's got this big 45. And he goes, click, to turn on the, off the safety. And I said, I just got one question. And I said, is that a 45? And he said, yeah, that's my baby. And he starts rubbing it. And then I started to walk towards him. I said, oh, I've never seen one before. And I started walking closer. And Mitch is going, no, no, put it away, put it away. You might grab it, you might grab it. So anyway, then he introduced, he says to the guy, introduce yourself. So this guy's five foot eight, about 180 pounds. So he's like 25 pounds overweight. He's got like black curly uh, hair down to his shoulders, Central American Indian face. And he says, my name is Roberto. I'm from Central America. And I said, oh, great. And he said, do you know what I do for a living? And I said, yeah, you're a hitman. He said, yeah, that's right. You're smart, Matthew. You know, Mitch and me were talking about you. And they explained that if I don't shut up about the certain topic, which I've been talking about in my interviews, this guy will take out my niece. And he'll take out me. So um, we share the same uh, uh, fear a little bit about people who will use torture and will use that kind of coercion and sort of sadistic uh, people. I, and I'm not, I'm not blaming Central Americans. I'm talking about the folks who were funded by the CIA that, that murdered all those you know, million people. So anyway, um, that's pretty frightening when they bring somebody up just for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. And I report all this to the police, but you know, the police, I should mention that because I think that's one of the questions that, that I wanted you to ask is if, you know, why aren't the police stopping this, right? Well, look at it from the police's perspective. They're trained in solving, you know, crimes in the community by criminals. Well, these guys are special forces. I mean, they're not even regular military, they're special forces. They have like 30 courses in law and just in breaking locks. And they know how to lo not leave evidence in every operation. They know how to do black operations. They have radios, communications, the best that the U.S. military has got. And do you think they're going to be able to, the police are going to be able to investigate these guys? No. Uh, no. No, no. I actually managed to get my, you know, Mitch interrogated only because of, of, of a banking record that was created when he forced me to open a bank account when I was torture trauma dissociated in scopalamine. So he probably, uh, he went in first and said, I'm going to fill out the forms. And I imagine he said, okay, I've got this autistic uh, retarded brother and he's coming in and uh, so I'm filling out the forms. So he fills out the forms. He sends me in with his fake ID, which I reported to the police, by the way. And the, the, in Canada, Bankers are pretty serious about asking for knowing your customer. They say, well, let's just verify the phone number. And so they, <laughs> they see the phone number. And, of course, he hasn't programmed me for this eventuality. So I just tell the truth. Guns for Palomar, you just do what you're told. You tell the truth. No, that's not my phone number. No, no, my phone number. And I gave him my home phone number. And uh, she, she, she wrote it all down. And, and I didn't change the mailing address because Mitch is right outside. I know I'll get killed if I change the mailing address. Mm -hmm. So then I say, oh, I better not say anything about this. And so, and he didn't ask me. And then, so what happens is nine months later, I get a call from the bank. And I have no memory of this, right? Because amnesia, right? From the torture trauma dissociation. 
and they say, oh, you know, um, hello, Mr. Polk. Uh, we are just calling about your checking account. We have uh, some more products and services you might be interested in. And I say, hell, I don't have a bank account with you guys. He said, well, your name, Matthew Polk. And I said, no, actually, you, you, that's not quite right in my last name. And, but your phone number is right. And I said, yeah, well, mailing address. And I told him my mailing address. said, oh, that's not our mailing address on file. So basically, I had a, a civilian intelligence and military guy, home address, linked on a bank account with my phone number. Oh, perfect. So it was perfect. And, of course, it's very credible from a bank, right? So I took this to the police. And they interrogated him. <laughs> but what were they thinking? I mean, this guy is trained to be able to withstand torture in North Korea if he's interrogated. You think they're going to be able to get anything out of him? Of course they didn't, right? And, and of course, I, that, I paid for that. You know, you know I, that was in January that they did that to him. In February, when he took me to that uh, 550 duplex and introduced Roberto to me, you know what Roberto did to me? This is my payback for getting the police involved. They said, okay, Mitch says, Matthew, you're right-handed, right? I said, no, and be sure, Matthew, if you get this wrong, we could, you know, you might die. I said, no, I'm sure I'm right-handed. So then they, they asked me, he says, Matthew, take off your right sock. So I take off my right sock. Roberto puts a clip on my right sock. It's like an, uh, a battery, uh, battery clip, but it's not clip. serrated. Yeah, the it's alligator serrated. clip. And he attaches it. Am I there? Yeah. Okay. And then... Mitch says, okay, now grab that thing that Roberto has, and Roberto's holding this probe. It's like a probe, right? Very phallic, actually. All chromed, and it's got a rubber insulator on his side, and Roberto's holding it. And he says, Matthew, touch it. And I go, no, I'm not going to touch it. And he starts pulling out his gun, and every time he pulls out his gun, right, I'm done. So I go and I touch him, and it's out. And I mean out by this bolt of lightning between my arm and my leg, and I'm unconscious, and I wake up, and, and they're holding me. They each got an arm around me, holding me up. And, and I, I'm, I'm hearing, my eyes are closed, I'm hearing them talk for the first 15 seconds. Then I open my eyes, and Mitch says, Oh, you're back. We didn't know if you were going to make it. You stopped breathing. But I, it's okay, I resuscitated you. And so they electrocuted me with a, I said, was that a car battery? And they said, no, actually, well, yeah, it was a car battery, but not exactly, it was a motorcycle battery. And they said, you know why we use a motorcycle battery? And I said, yeah, because it's more portable. And they said, yeah, that's right. So they electrocuted me with a goddamn battery, pardon my language, to make the point that I'm not allowed to go to the police. That would this do is in, it, wouldn't it? This is in Canada's largest city, and I live three blocks from the geographical center of Canada's largest city. And we are the number one ally of the United States of America. Well, let me ask you this. Yeah. What in the hell can we do, if anything, about any of this? And well, I think we better start with who are we exactly? Who am I talking about? Because it looks well, they, like you, they can just ahead. pick you off anytime they want. If, if someone would be so kind as to write a petition about my case and promote it, I, I would really appreciate that. Number two, if people will, will buy the book and, 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 and lobby their legislators I mean, preparing and, or, or even just signing a petition is a, is a great way to lobby legislators. But basically, until we uncover this stuff, we're not going, we've got to raise consciousness amongst the population about this is going on and that it's corrupting our democracies. So I would like people to, to buy the book, not because there's a lot of monetary value. I should say that in the eight months the book has been, been out, I've made as much as one day of work as a computer guy. <laughs> One day. Gotcha. So it's not about money. This is about getting people informed. And if you read my book, I think people who read my book, their lives will be changed in terms of their awareness about what's really going on in our political security and media system. And I think the more people, it's like, you know, my father once told me as an anthropologist, it's, it's a famous thing that they teach students in, in, in uh, Anthropology 101 about the 100 monkey thing where there's there's a there's a bunch of monkeys living on these islands in the south pacific or something and one day you know they're they take a piece of fruit from you know that falls from a tree and 
they eat it. And it's got sand and stuff and you know, a bit of mud on it or whatever. But one day, a monkey goes and washes the fruit in the water. And his, his fruit tastes so much better, he loves it. And so the next time he goes to get a piece of fruit, he does the same thing. And now other monkeys are watching him. And so now, you know, other monkeys that are close to him start washing their fruit as well. But still, it's just, a, you know, a handful of monkeys for like a couple months that are doing this. But then one day, it reaches a critical point where you get like about 100 monkeys that are washing on this one island. Suddenly, a whole island is washing their fruit in the water. And not just that island, but the other islands too that are around the, this island. And the, the, the point, and this is supposed to be a true story, the point of this is that, that when you get enough consciousness happening, you get to a certain point where you get like a critical mass, and then the idea opens up and everyone starts to get it. Yeah. Yeah, I like the howler monkeys. It's yeah. You know, the ones that are, their throats swell up. They're yes. so funny, you know. You, there was this amazing, I'll be brief with this, so there's this amazing video. This one's just sitting there, and he's, he's bored to death. You know, you can tell. He's just looking around like a, like a little man up there thinking about stuff. Then he suddenly goes, blah. <laughs> and a couple of others look at him like, what's up with him? And he does it again. <laughs> he's just starting something. Before, before 30 seconds has gone by, the whole tree, they're all raising hell. So interesting. Maybe almost get, like almost like laughing yeah. amongst humans when we laugh, right? If enough people start laughing, the whole room will start laughing. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, I, I got to tell you something. I uh, if there has been as disturbing a conversation, let alone a more disturbing conversation, I don't remember it, and uh, I don't think it's uh, cognitive dissonance at all. I think it's. Uh, this is really something else. And you're either really, really good at this or you're really, really real. Because I don't detect a note of insincerity in anything that you have said, in any look on your face, nothing. No vocal intonations. There is nothing in what you have said that suggests to me that you're making any of this up. I'm just saying it for the record. And there it's recorded. It's done. So... um well, thank you so much for saying that. I, I really appreciate that. I can't believe that you had the uh, the testicular fortitude to come out to in, into public and do these uh, interviews. By the way, when were you on with uh, with George Norrie? That would have been uh, January twenty uh, seventh, I believe, okay. or or the twentieth, twentieth or twenty seventh. And then something weird happened the next, the very next month. Um, yes, in fact, you're right. And and a few weeks later. Is the February thing, which yeah. was the February thing, was the worst home invasion and abduction I've ever had in my life. It was like really, I mean, being, you know, I've, I've shared it with you. It's horror. It's horror. So it's clear that I, I didn't apparently uh, play by the rules enough in that interview. How do you get out completely other than public exposure like this? This would seem to be your best defense, really. Correct. That, that that is the only way out is and I have uh, uh, several other interviews in the next uh, week and a half. Uh, they're not nearly as big as yours, but they're still important interviews. And so and hopefully I can get further bookings based on on these interviews. So uh, that's the way to go, I think. It's all right with you if we put this up on our YouTube channel then. Oh, I am so honored if you would. I really would. I would be so honored. We Thank will, you. We will make your book the book of the month as well. Fantastic. That's so kind of you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Any any message to the world? The world could use a good message, something that will inspire them, something that will make them feel as though just because this thing is big and scary does not mean that it won't go the same way that Goliath did. When uh, David said, take this armor off, it's too damn heavy, I don't like this, take it off. Just give me that sling, give me that rock over there, and just smacked him and wound up decapitating him going, there, there's your bad man right there, all right? That's right, and I, I can say something, that people have come to me, both on the Internet, in fact, a lot on the Internet, and helped me, and actually got me really big interviews. Um, I have a, a neighbor friend just a few doors down that is the most, she's a Christian, and she's most kind, loving person I've ever met, and she has taken me and my wife under her protection and is taking, you know, 
being very, very supportive of us. And what I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of really decent, loving, caring, honest, ethical people in this world. And we just need to continue to expand those circles and, and we can make a huge difference in, in, in the lives of us and the future generations. I would really like to talk to you again sometime. Why don't we do that uh, when we get into fall a little bit? That would be great. Right. I would enjoy that very much. And please, if anything else happens um, that you'd care to let us know about, good, bad, uh, Lord forbid, ugly, uh, let Ken know and he'll let us know like within a few seconds after receiving your information, okay? I'd really like to keep up with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I will do that.